Hi, everybody. Welcome by a new episode of Follow Your Passion. Please welcome my guest, Melanie Gell. She is a professional musician and published author. Her passion has always been discovering quirky bits of lost history. She is educated in classical and opera performance and has found a way to turn her passion into a career. As a professional singer, Melanie is touring the world performing lost knitting songs from World War I and II, as well as funny popular songs from the early 20th uh, century. She has integrated this music into uh, theater pieces, which she's hired to perform uh, both in the USA as well as overseas. Think of Taiwan, Scotland, China, Sudan, and many more. This July 2022, her book about forget, uh, forgotten 1930s film star Diana Durbin is coming out. And in 2023, her second book is coming out about the forgotten history of the house sparrow. Welcome, Melanie. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm great. Um, we had a pre-talk uh, before this uh, this podcast, and you said you know you're 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 uh, educated as an opera singer. Um, I am. Yes. But you're also more or less some sort of historian, right? You're 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 very interested or has a passion for quirky bits uh, of lost history. How did you come with knitting songs? Well, at the, at, it was back in 2009. So back in 2009, I was singing opera full time. I was going around as, as you do, auditioning for operas, getting different opera roles all over the world, mm -hmm. you know, Israel and in, in Italy, in France, just all over. I was and all over America, all over Canada. And my sister discovered knitting and she she loved knitting. She just it was she just all she talked about was knitting. And then she's she wanted me to start knitting and at the time I thought I don't have time I don't I can just go buy a hat like who needs a hat yeah. now that I make I have learned I have learned I am a knitter now but back then I thought you know I don't I want to help her with her passion but also I don't want to actually have to waste my time knitting so I thought okay I'm a singer I wonder if there's any songs about knitting so mm -hmm. I, I mean yes I was primarily a performer at that point but also I I always loved the stories around the music and discovering music people didn't know, not the operas that people always wanted to hear, which, you know, unfortunately, opera companies, just because of funding, tend to put on the operas that people want to hear. Um, they, they're, they're, you don't get to see that lost opera Bellini half finished or the one opera, you know, Beethoven didn't quite finish. Those are the ones you don't get to see. And that's what I loved. That's what I loved. But it wasn't the most marketable thing for a career. So I started looking for knitting songs. I found one. I found another. I found 12 more. And it just oh, kind wow. of went on from there. I know. And then I actually got a grant from the, the Alberta government in Canada to, to finish this research. So I spent the next several years researching and recording the music. And then I wrote a show around it because I thought, you know what? How do you share this music with people? Um, if it's a show with stories and uh, sometimes a slideshow and people come and they knit, it's a way it's a way to sort of make it an experience and make it living history. And so that is what I that's what I do. Nice, nice. Great story, by the way. So Thanks. could you take us through um, a particular evening about you, you already shared one of pre-talk. How does uh, such a show of knitting goes? You, you sing songs. Are people actually knitting in the in the audience or? Um. Yes. So, <laughs> um. When, uh, usually, when they when they do the materials to promote the show, they tell people to bring their knitting. And sometimes I even have little prizes. So people bring their knitting. Um. They often show off their knitting. So they'll get up. They'll come on stage, and people wear all sorts of things like beautiful and crochet i mean and sometimes tatted i mean it's all it's all sorts of handcrafts so they come they come up on stage they show off different things they're wearing in a recent show in northern england someone's someone came i think she was 97 and she oh, brought wow. a sweater she, yeah i was she her daughter brought her and she had brought a sweater that she knit in world war ii when she was 10 or 11 and she hadn't actually worn it because she, she had a growth spurt. It didn't fit her anymore. She knit the sweater. She put it away in a drawer. So it was in perfect condition, this beautiful sweater that she had knit. And she got to bring it and everyone just like applauded for the sweater. And it was a way for her to be seen and for her to be relevant for the work she had done. Yes, it was 70 some years later. <laughs> However, you know, I mean, it was just, it was this beautiful piece of history that got, that got to come out. Um, so people show off their knitting. Um, one time someone in Australia brought a knitted kangaroo, Hoppy. <laughs> Her name was Hoppy, I was told. 
So yeah. I mean, that knitted kangaroo had to come. I did a show um, again in England, a different one in England a couple months ago, and someone brought a knitted meerkat. So people sometimes bring animals they knit. Um, they were knitting things for Ukraine. The last tour I did, you know, they bring all of this and they, they show off the different things that they've knit. And it's a way to share and make it almost, a, it, it starts off as a community. And sometimes, sometimes I actually give a workshop before about a certain kind of World War II knitting. Um, sometimes the venue who hires me puts on a workshop. There was one mm. once about knitting flags from different countries. So I got this knitted Canadian flag because I'm, I'm Canadian. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, then I do the show. Um, basically, it's singing songs from World War One, World War Two, and there's a slideshow of of images of photographs that I found to basically support the show to make it. I don't always have the slideshow, but it makes it more interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, usually, we do a question and answer afterwards. I don't always know the answers because people ask all sorts of things, and depending on where you're performing, if it's about how they source their wool or you know, wool shortages, it is a very, re that's a very regional thing. So I try to find out as much as I can, but if I don't know the answer, someone else there will. So again, it becomes more of a discussion and it just, it builds community and it saves history. And it does, I mean, as far as putting the spotlight on women in the war and, and the work they did at home that people don't remember, it is a way to preserve and celebrate history. And I, I mean, I love that. It's just, it, it's like having a community wherever you go in the world through history wow. and music. So, yeah. So it's it's not only a theater piece, it's actually a true experience for the people as well. I try to make it that. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and like I said, it's it's fun. I've made friends doing these shows. I mean, that we connect later. I've stayed in the house of people later. I come back and they've come seen the show and we've communicated. So, yes, it is. it builds a giant network and community of knitters through this music that even at the time wasn't felt to be all that relevant, but it's funny that it's found its relevance as, as a record of history, 75 nice. years later. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, indeed. So, um, you didn't write a book about it, about knitting, I think. Um, I start, I started to write a book about the yeah. world war one culture of knitting. Mm -hmm. Um, it is maybe not the most easy book to sell. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, mean, no. I, I did. I, you know, I, I pitched the book. Um, still working on that one. I mean, honestly, that'll probably be the next book is to is to sort of rework that book. But then, but I thought, you know what? Um, when the pandemic hit, all the singing stopped, and I needed. I had done research of, on several other fronts. I don't just do knitting songs. Yeah. And I thought, all right, I'm going to use this time to actually, you know, pitch a book to an agent, try to get a publishing deal, and I did. Not through knitting, though. Now, um, talking about that, about uh, the new book, about uh, the film star Diana Durbin. Mm -hmm. And I must say that, indeed, I didn't know her. <laughs> so how, how come? You know, uh, I, I think your, your, uh, uh, your book is also about Judy Garland, right? It is. Uh, people that, don't name, know that name people rings don't... a bell, but yes. Diana Durbin it doesn't ring a bell. Um, Diana Durbin wanted to be forgotten. When she left Hollywood, she was 28 years old. She was fed up with everything. She wanted to live an adult life away from the spotlight. And mm. she actually died fairly recently. She died in 2013. So, I mean, she had a long, happy life away from the spotlight, but she, it's not that she made it her life's work, but it, her passion was to be forgotten. And um, in a lot of ways, Hollywood doesn't have a long memory. I mean, her movie, yeah. she wasn't in that many movies. And, you know, once they, for the most part, stopped being played, her name was always linked to Judy Garland's name because they were rivals yeah. since they were 12. Not their choice. This was a movie studio Hollywood thing. But um, this is the 100th anniversary of both of their both of their lives. It's the centenary of both of them. And it's time that she's remembered because there are there is a lot of moments in history that were actually um, influenced by the fame of Deanna Durbin and movie conventions nowadays that wouldn't exist if it weren't for her and her films and people just don't know this so again i felt like it was history that was sort of fluttering away and i had to catch it and bring it back and show it to people before it's gone because it's actually the story is fascinating it's not just the story of a life it's the story of a time that's gone and and yeah. um and yeah and, and about the rivalries in in hollywood that still exist but that were even you know back then were just as strong as ever
Yeah. So uh, is it all your own research or did you also uh, interview family members of, of the end or? Um, it's my own research, but through the research I did, I found a lot of old, a lot of libraries have these, these amazing resources. They just basically have information dumps. People will have donated old scrapbooks or old notes. Um, I found reporter notes from interviews they did with her. You know, I found handwritten notes in, in archives and libraries. So, I mean, I based it upon um, newspaper articles, journal articles, handwritten notes from accredited journalists back in the day. Um, it basically all just thousands of different articles, basically piecing the story together, figuring out what was media spin, what was truth. And um, yeah, it was it was several years of research, which I had done in advance for the show I wrote about her. I, it's another show I do. So when it came time yeah. for the book, I, I had collected all the research. I just had to organize it, write a book and sell the book, basically. So again, lost history, lost history. Yeah. So if we're talking about your your passion, is it indeed the discovering the these these quick bits of lost history or is it is it singing or is it a combination of the of the two or um, my passion is making history live again in a way that it won't be so easily lost i think these stories are incredibly important and there are others too i mean there's there's a few other ones i do but these stories this bit of history i want to make it my passion is making it palpable making it so people can understand it in in not a not an academic way necessarily but in a way that it becomes part of their lives you know if they if they see an orchestra playing in a movie and they say huh i know i know the source of that i know where that came from you know if they hear the story of say anne frank you know who hid in amsterdam and, and say right deanna durbin was 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 her passion i mean that's what kept her hopes up was thinking of deanna's movies i mean just being able to link things to these bits of lost history and make them mm. live again. So yeah. that, I guess that's, I've never put it into words. That's my passion. Here we are. Nice. <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. And um, so I saw this, this deadline on Amazon when the book is coming out. So uh, is yeah, it good to have such a, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, does it help to have a deadline to, to finish the book or because like you said, you know, there's so many libraries that has, information dumps in it and i guess if you truly want if you're a perfectionist you're never done doing the research right that's true that is true um i mean the deadline the deadline was what last september i believe that's when i actually submitted the book so i mean in publishing that's how it works it's a year in it's about 18 months from when you submit the book to when it actually comes out okay 18, 12 to 18 and it keeps getting moved because of supply shortages it's actually supposed to be out already there wasn't enough paper yeah, in the world yeah. so it just keeps getting moved but um yes you know there's always the thought what if what if i uncover what if i find an amazing tidbit that i i missed um yeah i hope i don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can't I mean, imagine it might happen i yeah. guess i guess if it's popular there'll be a second edition and it would be added then but um as far as the story I wanted to tell about her life and how it matched up with that of Judy Garland I think I told it I think it's pretty well told I, I suppose if I find X, I'm sure more things will come out because the book will come out and people will have stories. People, this people come to me with their stories. And I guess I, that will just be things that I, I can write an article about the book or do yeah. an interview about the book and, and share the information that way, I guess. Nice. Nice. And your second book is about the forgotten history about the house sparrow. Yes. it's of, of all birds, you're choosing the house sparrow. How come? <laughs> Okay, that no one's ever asked that. Okay, there's a couple reasons. Number one, I have a pet house sparrow. Um, oh, okay. It, yes, it just sort of happened. She's not here. Or I would. She's. I'm in Florida and she's in Canada right now. But um, I was in New York. I was. I was living in New York and I was volunteering at an animal shelter and they got in a little baby house sparrow who couldn't mm -hmm. fly, so she couldn't be released. They were gonna probably euthanize her because her wings just hadn't grown. The feathers hadn't grown right. So I took her okay. home seven years ago. And she's my bird. Um, she imprinted to me. So um, I was that weird girl with a house sparrow who traveled. <laughs> I traveled to music festivals. I toured with this house sparrow kind of waiting backstage and chirping. And I, thanks to the internet, I discovered, I think I met 600 other people around the world who have house sparrows as pets. Okay. Huh. And it's this weird community. I mean, because if you think about it, 
people find hobbies because they like the same thing. You know, people go to church because they believe the same thing. Um, people have house sparrows because they happen to have found one on the ground. I mean, that's the only link is that you didn't leave a bird to die. I mean, that's the yeah. only link that, so I mean, the, I have met some amazing people, you know, there are people in India and in Abu Dhabi in all over England where it's illegal to have house sparrows. So no, they don't get to tell anybody else about that. <laughs> yeah. um, it is legal to keep them as a pet in North America. Um, yeah. So all these, all these people. And then I started thinking, well, house sparrows aren't native to North America. You know, they, they, they were an introduced species. They were brought over on purpose in 1851 and then again in 1853. So I thought, okay, what's going on? You know, why, why, why are they considered an invasive species? So I started looking at their history in North America and the world. And it's crazy. Like their history is crazy. Um, mm -hmm. I cannot believe, again, I uncovered all this stuff and I am sure I will find more because we're talking, you know, the entirety of human history, there is house sparrow history. They have been around since humans actually became <clears throat> proper humans. You know, it's, it's been 70,000 years at least of the modern house sparrow. And so finding their it's everywhere. So, you know, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure there are things that I'm missing. I'm sure that there's more information, but, but, um, I thought that again, there's nothing about this. So it's their history. And it's also about how people have kept yeah. them as pets and how they've changed people's lives. So nice. yeah, it's yeah. weird. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. So will there be a little guest role for Johnny Depp? Um, I mean, as they've never been pirates. This is the thing. They've never yeah. been pirates. Um, but you know what the fact that he was named jack sparrow is very telling because sparrows you know they like to fight they like to to be ostentatious they they're very much like like that character nice <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, i remember when i traveled that um uh we went to mexico on holiday we've been to africa and mm -hmm. uh, in the netherlands we see a lot of house sparrows uh, as seagulls as well when you live near the coast mm -hmm. and i remember when i was in san francisco I saw a lot of uh, pelicans, right? Uh -huh. And I said, wow, uh, pelicans. I'm not used to seeing pelicans in the wild, you know? So I was a bit amazed by that. When I was in Africa, I saw a lot of vultures. So I thought to myself, you know, would this pelican in San Francisco and this vulture in Africa, would it be their house sparrow as we uh, have them in the Netherlands? That's a good question. Um, I I don't know, you know, possibly what's interesting is house sparrows are actually a protected species in the Netherlands. Um, they're not everywhere. They're not a protected species in North America. They are in the Netherlands. So um, they, they're they appreciated a bit more where you are. Yeah, just... we'll, we'll take care of the little ones. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, of course, I have to ask, are there any songs about house sparrows? There are, there are so many songs that mention sparrows. Jack Brell, I mean, we're talking big songs that mention sparrows. There mm -hmm. are country songs. So yes, I am considering, I am considering doing an album to coincide <laughs> with the book about songs about house sparrows. So yeah, that is, that's actually another project that I'm, there are so many. This is the oh, problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, sparrows appear, the thing is they're everywhere. They're invasive also in the arts. You know, they're in art, they're in poetry, they're in music. So yes. There nice. Certainly are. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're the, the only person I know in the world that is uh, writing about forgotten history and also has a musical uh, theater piece to go with it. It's it's good promotion. I mean, really, yeah. it's, you know, you get to go do your show, sell a book. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a way to sort of put everything together. And it's taken years to build this. But, you know, now I... I tour all over Europe. I tour all over North America. Um, I'm here at this festival. I'm at a festival right now in Florida doing a show about lost songs of American prohibition. So mm. um, again, it's just, it's another facet of history that I felt needed to be saved. It's a lot nice. of work. Oh yeah, I can imagine. But uh, would you really consider it work as it's your passion? It's that's a good question. It's work, but it's work I love doing. I mean, today, today my show is in the evening and I'm going to be spending the day working on doing graphic design for another festival in Scotland um, for another show I'm doing and then memorizing yet another show. So, I mean, it's, it is constant work, but I love it. I mean, I yeah. wouldn't choose to do anything else. I guess that's, so it is work, but it's also what defines work, you know, it's, a, yeah. you can love, you can love your work. Exactly. You know, I think, uh, 
I think it's a quote of somebody that said, you know, if you do what you love to do, you never have to work again. Yeah, or, actually, or if you do what you love to do in the arts, you never stop working, which is also <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a it, it consumes a lot of time. That's 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 the drawback of, of the situation. But since we're loving what we're doing, yeah. uh, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, but that's the thing. People ask, "Do I have hobbies?" And I'm like, "I don't need hobbies because I love like what I the." And again, I think work has a negative connotation sometimes. It is work, but I love doing this work. I wouldn't yeah. choose to sit on the beach if I could be reading over something amazing about history. So it, it's work, but it's. It's yeah. great work. I feel I, it's also a bit of a noble goal because you, I mean, it is doing something no one else is doing. So yeah, you're actually leaving a legacy for, for other people, you know? I hope so. That's my goal. That's my only goal here. Yeah. <laughs> so. Nice. Well, I had a, I had an interview with another uh, entrepreneur as well. And she actually said that a lot of people are afraid to, um, uh, to use the, to do the passion full time, you know, to make a living out of it, because uh -huh. they're afraid that once they turn it into work, they won't they won't like it anymore. And I think that that has to do with the definition that people have about work, you know, that it's something you must do and it's an obligation. While if you consider it being, you know, I get to do my passion full time, and people are willing to pay for it. It's a totally different definition. I mean, it does. It is. And it, again, it's taken several years to sort of work up to the point where I don't have another job. This is my full-time job. And no, I don't own a house, but houses are expensive anyway. So that's okay. Who needs a house? But um, yeah. <laughs> I would love a house. However, you know, apart from that, it's worth following your passion because once you start getting co like financially compensated for it, it does sort of show you that you made the right choice. And it's, how do I, like, okay, I didn't like singing opera. It didn't make me happy. So, I mean, they could have said being a singer was your passion, but it it wasn't. It was work. It was unhappy work. It was something I didn't love doing. And I, at a certain point, I thought, well, I, I've i made it. Is this it? I mean, I, you know, I've worked my entire yeah. life. I was six years old to be a professional singer. And this, this is it. I mean, I'm supposed to be happy and I'm not, I'm not happy. So, I mean, I have friends who've sung at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, and then the next day they're out auditioning. And I was like, you're, I don't want to only be as good as my last performance. That's not what I, I want. So I want to be able to build something that also takes off on its own. Yeah. So sometimes you have to do the thing that makes you unhappy for just long enough to realize the value of following your passion. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and so, I mean, I was supposed to be happy. I had made what I was supposed to do in classical music. Things were going very well. But it just it was it just wasn't for me. And there is a certain amount of letting go. If you've done say say you're I don't know, say you're a computer programmer and you've done the training and you've gotten a decent job in it and you're like, wait, I've done everything I was supposed to do to reach my goal, but I'm not happy. So sometimes you have to have done that work and taken that path to realize that, you know what, I need to do a different path. And it can be a similar path, but also it's worth taking the risk because you don't get any reward otherwise. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and you're, you're gifted to the beautiful voice, hmm, except it wasn't for opera, right? It was, hmm. and now you're able to use your, your, your talent, your, your, your voice to do something you love to do, you know, to bring history back to life again and entertain people and, and build communities around this subject you're singing about. And also an interesting thing is when you follow your passion, it's not, so say I decided I wanted to sing historic music. So, okay, that's the thing I do, but there are so many sort of side things that can bring an in income that can, that can stem from that. You know, I've run knitting workshops. I've been a keynote speaker at knitting events. You know I mean? There, there are all these side things that sort of come. So following your passion doesn't just have to be one thing. It does after a while, it does sort of spider web out to, yeah. to other things. Um, I, I, I professionally edit people's books because I, I mean, I am a good writer. I know all the rules for, you know, for the different writing styles. So, I mean, that, that's another thing that I do casually. So, I mean, there, it, there are a lot of things connected to following my passion that, yeah. that aren't exactly that, but it all, it all comes together to be one thing. I think that's the point of what you, what you say, you know, it, it all comes together. It's not just one thing, but like you said, you know, when you start, sharing a story like knitting 
other people mm-hmm. come with with other stories and uh, you can you can could be your interest as well you know you could take it from there and and think uh, opportunities will come when when you're open for it sometimes they give you a knitted kangaroo yeah exactly <laughs> you never know he's giant he's like this big but anyway <laughs> So you never know what's going to come. Sometimes a knitted kangaroo. So Yeah, <laughs> nice. So are there any, uh, well, you already shared one with this 97-old year lady that, that showed mm-hmm. her sweater when she, when she knitted when she was about 10. Um, are there any favorite countries you would like to, you, you'd like to travel to? Greenland. Greenland. Which I realize I realize that's Denmark, but Greenland, I would like to go there. I've been to so many countries. I've wanted to go to Greenland since I was seven. Um, I don't even know why at this point, there is no point to it. It's just, I, I want to go to Greenland. That's it. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I've, I've been to a lot of countries. I've been to something like 60 countries. I love them all. Well, more, some more than others. And yeah. um, Greenland, that's where I'd like to go. Nice. So you've performed your show, uh, like I said, the introduction in, in countries like Taiwan, Scotland, China, Sudan, USA as well. Um, mm-hmm. Totally different cultures. But yes. does it also mean that the, the, the knitting is different or do you see similarities between different cultures? The knitting is different. And sometimes that wasn't the knitting show, but the way where I've done the knitting show... Um, For example, in Northern England and in Scotland, people knit these Guernsey sweaters and different fishermen. And this is something from the 19th and 18th century or 20th and 19th century. They would they would knit various sweaters with various patterns on it. So Mm -hmm. just in case your fisherman drowned and like the fish ate his face, you had to know you'd know who it was by his sweater. So there is a huge tradition of Guernsey sweater knitting there. Um, There's different ways people hold their wool. There's different there. I mean, the, in in the UK, sometimes they hold it under their arm and knit like this. You know, I put my ball down on the couch and I knit like that. So I mean, the types yeah. of knitting are different. I do try to find regional stories to add depending on where I am because it is interesting. I mean, around Leeds and Manchester in England, because I I was just in England, so it's, it's on my mind. I mean, that was a major producing. You know, they were producing yarn cloths. They you know that's a big sheep area. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing I do is I sing French, French songs, like lost French cabaret songs. So a lot of those overseas gigs were actually for the French expat community or for the French community. And they were these, yeah. these lost French songs. And I mean, when I sang them in Sudan, people that I did a workshop at the, at the women's university there, and, you know, they taught me some of their French cabaret songs, you know I mean? So there's an exchange also of music and of, of experience. It's not just me t- singing at people, you know, often a local group will open for me or they'll they'll come to a workshop and and you do learn stories and share share stories and make connections nice i do you have a favorite language to sing in i mean i french it's french yeah. um you can just be so dramatic in french and i mean <laughs> I, i'm from canada so i've i learned a canadian french accent which they just laugh at anywhere else so um so it's it's the parisian it's putting on the parisian accent sometimes and then sometimes the canadian one it's fun to play with that um yeah just i french is a very i mean german also is a very um expressive language to sing mm-hmm. in but i french you can roll your r's i just like i just i yeah, love yeah, it yeah. Just, yeah. you can really just let her rip in french so yes yeah yeah the, the reason i was asking because uh if, if i'm think, uh, thinking about opera you know uh italy comes to mind immediately yes. there are a lot of italian operas um and the, I have no idea what they're singing about, but it sounds wonderful. <laughs> I, I know a little bit French, you know. Um, I remember when my mother uh, said that I was a very big fan of Edith Piaf when I was little, and I mean real little. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's something about that language, indeed. Yeah. For opera, it, it Italian is the healthiest language to sing in. There's these long vowels. They're long vowels. It lets you vocally open up. That's one reason why there's such a strong opera tradition in Italy. I mean, mm. it is the sort of the healthiest language to sing in a way, vocally, in classical music. 
Plus there'll be, there'll be a seven minute aria, seven minute song with like five words that just repeat. So really easy to memorize. <laughs> okay. I mean, a German song will be two minutes long with like 6,000 words. So I mean, and you're just like, oh my God, so many words. Yeah. Um, the French is kind of in the middle. <laughs> you can, that's kind of, it's kind of in the middle between the two. Yeah. But Edith Piaf was called the little sparrow. And again, there's a connection with history, with sparrows, with music, yeah. everything's connected. Yeah, I think there will never be a, a Dutch opera because our our sounds are very harsh, you know. Uh, even in World War II, we had uh, we used secret codes that had uh, a G in it because a lot of foreign people can't pronounce the G as we do. Oh, okay. So we call it uh, uh, a G, and that's very harsh, you know. Uh, so uh, Scheveningen is, uh, and a lot of, uh, especially uh, German um People, they were saying like Scheveningen. So we immediately knew it wasn't a Dutchman. So, and but That's I guess uh, because of those harsh sounds, it's it's definitely not suited for uh, opera. <laughs> it will hurt your opera. voice, I guess. Perhaps, yes. Yeah. But I mean, you've got folk songs. There's definitely music in Dutch. So oh, yeah, definitely. There's a, lot, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of music. Doesn't doesn't have to be opera. That's okay. No. Yeah. But if I, if I look at the international market, the only thing we're very good at are uh, DJs. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, and Swe you and Sweden are sort of yeah. the two big ones. And they don't sing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Probably there's a reason for it. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's a great language. It's, it's every time I'm there, I love to hear it, so. Yeah, and a lot of people also can hear the, the accent from us. Um, I don't know. Um, we, we actually got this this funny book in uh, the Netherlands. It's called um, I Always Get My Sin. Okay. And that's because it's a Dutch uh, saying that's literally translated into English. Oh. And there are some Dutch people that are choosing the English word that sounds the same like the Dutch word. And they think that's the same, oh. but it isn't. So that's why it says I always get the sin. In Dutch, we, if you would actually translate it into I'll always get what I want, right? Oh, okay. So that's but, the English but, pronunciation. And in mm -hmm. uh, in Dutch, it it's almost sounds like I always get my sin. But it's a totally different meaning if you know what sin means. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, honestly, that sounds like a great motto. Yeah. I always get my sin. <laughs> I'm good with that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so it's so funny because um even high politicians, you know, they, they make those little mistakes that they don't know what they're saying in English. And it's it, it's actually a quite funny, uh, funny book to read. Yeah, it sounds really good. It, and I mean, again, that's it just shows that not everything has to be in English. No, exactly. Yes. So, um, Melanie, are there any other big products that are uh, coming your way that you know of? <laughs> Kind of. I mean, they're, they're musical ones. I'm I, What I'm supposed to be doing today is I'm memorizing a show I wrote about the music of Noel Coward, because although he is well known, he wrote over 300 songs and people don't remember all of his songs. So I mean, I'm actually doing a show about his life. Um, he was the English playwright in case people should not everyone remembers him. You know, he died just under 50 years ago. And again, he had a massive legacy and it's slowly being forgotten. So I'm going to Bring back some of that. I'm doing a show about him in Edinburgh in Scotland this summer. So that's okay. coming up. Nice. Um, yeah. And also I have to start promoting this book. <laughs> I mean, so really I need, I need to start working on that a lot. I'm, I'm recording a CD right now. I've started it in New York last week and I'll go back in a couple months and finish just about some just eclectic mix of songs. There's no noble goal for that one. It's just music. I love, you know, it was a long pandemic and I thought, you know what? I just want to record a CD. So, um, you know, got some grant money from the government and yay Canada and, um, nice. I'm, yay. And so I'm working, just working on that because that makes me the most happy really. So just, it, that's just something, something for me. And again, it's all connected though, because people will buy the CD it shows, um, they do for my other ones. So why not? And just, yeah. just kind of keeping things going, you know, booking shows, doing this, working on the book, working on the bird book. That's just, again, it's all, it all just sort of comes together. You work on these various things and it all, it all comes together in the end to be so much fun. And because nice. yes, it's a lot of work, but I also can just put it down and go for a swim. I mean, this is the thing. I'm my own boss. 
for the most part, you know, and I have to, I have to be committed to what I'm doing, but I also can just stop yeah. for the day when I want and go have fun and doing the work is fun. So it's just, I don't know. It's, it's nice. just all good. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. So I, I think we can spend hours on talking about these subjects and about the passions. Um, unfortunately we don't have time, <laughs> but uh, do you have a little tip or a little piece of wisdom you would like to share with the audience about following your passion or yes. becoming an entrepreneur? Yes, I do. So <laughs> when you're following your passion, it doesn't have to be music, whatever it is you're doing, be aware of your audience, be aware of maybe not audience, be aware of, of who you want to sell your product to, who you want to, to recompense you for the work, the passion, the, the, the work you're doing, you know, because if, if I were to be writing a book with no audience, there'd be no point, you know, in a way, and, and maybe I'm not putting this really well, but, you know, follow your passion, but do it in a way that that's clever, do it in a way that that is marketable. And every passion has has a marketable way to do it. You know, I'm at a lot of theater festivals and people will do shows that no one wants to see. And they'll say, oh, you should come see my show because I want you to. But no, you have to make a show that they they will want to see. You have to, I, whatever your passion is, you know, if you're designing a computer game, you have to design one that people will want to play. You know, if you're, if you're making yeah. fashion, if you're making clothes, don't do something just because you think it's good. Do something you love that other people will also want. So per, make a product, make whatever you're doing. I can't think of any more examples because it's really early here. But whatever whatever you're doing, do something that people will will want, and that puts you one step ahead. Yeah, wonderful. I think I think also uh, connected to that is uh, think about what positive impact you would like to make on the world. Because if you're making a positive impact, people need it or people want it, and then there's a win-win situation. You know, yes. you can have you can have a passion for binge watch, uh, watching, but there's no money in it, unless you're a tester of television series or whatever. But it's um, it's like you said, you know, it. If you want to do it full time, there should be people out there that are willing to pay for your effort and your involvement. So it's it's good to keep yeah. that in your mind, indeed. Yeah. And one more thing I just actually thought of, there is nothing more valuable than building a community. This is the thing. I mean, when you're doing, when you're following your passion in a lot of ways you are working alone and there are people out there who, who will help you, who, you know, for my book, I needed a, I needed a famous person to quote for the cover. And I, I didn't know any famous people in, in movies, you know, and I, you know, put it out to the community that I built the community that I know, and then communities that I've joined. So basically these different these different online communities and all of a sudden people were helping me, people were connecting me with who I needed. So the connections you make, and often it's by being more generous than what you expect to get back. Yeah. Um, those are invaluable when you're doing this. And also it's, you have the support of kind strangers, you know, yeah. it's also, that's nice. It makes it all feel less alone. It makes it feel more possible. And, and also helping other people will in the end also just help you hopefully. Yeah. So you just made me curious who's on the cover. Um, her name is Jane Atkinson. She's, if you, if you look her up, she's been in everything. She's been in 24. She has been in um, Madame Secretary. She's been in The Walking Dead. She's an actress. She's, she has been in dozens of fame, Free Willy, the movie. And she, she was, I mean, she's a busy working actress who had never met me. And because of another author who connected us, she took the time to read my entire book. I mean, we're wow. talking about it takes the day I sent it to her and then wrote this lovely quote for the cover within, within a couple of days. And she's busy nice. and she doesn't know me. So again, <laughs> um, it, it was an amazing, generous thing for her to do. I yeah. owe a kidney pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, you know, someday if I become a famous author from this, I will do the same for someone else. So yeah, nice. Yeah. Great, great. So if people want to know more about you or your shows or want to uh, connect with you, how can they do that? I've got a web page, so it's melaniegall.com um, or just Google Melanie Gall. I come up. I'm, I'm all over the internet. There's only a few of us out there and I think I'm the most active. So <laughs> Um, nice. yeah, I, you know, I send me a, send me an email I'd love to connect with people. So. Perfect. I love talking to you, uh, with you, Melanie, you have great energy and it shows when you're talking about your passion and that's what the show is all about. So thanks again for taking your time to be my guest and let's keep in touch. All right. Thank you so much.